Welcome, everyone, uh, to the fifth Crowd Investing Symposium here in Berlin. Let me um, state at the outset, uh, we've been hit heavily by the storm. We lost around a third of our participants for the scientific workshop. So we appreciate every single one of you. Um, um, and um, uh, we, we did not only lose some of our, of our participants for the scientific workshop, uh, for the scientific part of the conference, but also for the panel discussion. So Mrs. Uh, Schwertner of, of, from, from FIGO uh, will not be able to join us. Um, currently, um, Jens Tönnesmann, who is supposed to be moderating the panel discussion, is stuck in a bus from Hamburg to Berlin. So I might have to fill in as moderator, which of course is something a law professor is not used to at all, um, but I will try to, to do my best. Um, also, um, Levin Holle of the Ministry of Finance cannot be here, but um, we are very glad that uh, Doris Dietze um, uh, will be here to replace him, um, also from the Ministry of Finance. Of course, I will introduce all participants of the panel discussion later. Um, so, um, I, I'm not a big fan of, of long introductions, so I will keep it very, very short. Um, this conference is, a, is, is part of a research project which started five years ago. Um, five years ago, um, the, the conference consisted of basically two presentations, if I remember correctly, one by Lars Hornhoff on the economic side of crowdfunding, one by me of the, of the legal side of crowdfunding. Uh, and since then, we've, we've grown, and uh, this year we've had uh, 41 participants, around 20 presentations and comments, um, participants from, from eight different countries, um, and, and we're very happy to, to see this kind of um, development. Um, also, um, we, we moved the conference from Munich to Berlin, so you can see we're, we're definitely making some kind of progress here. Um, uh, all right, um, so one, one final uh, point on today's subject. Um, I think, I think it's, 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 it's an open secret that, that the digitalization of finance is probably the most interesting part of securities regulation uh, right now. And, and the reason for this is very easy to understand. If you think about how banks affect everybody's life and, and the economy as a whole, it's very important to, to see uh, how this industry is developing and, and, and what, what the changes are and, and, and what we should do about this. And this, of course, is not a problem of Germany or the, United, or, or, or the EU um, alone, but, but of every industrialized country, any, any developed country. And that's why we are um, very happy to have um, a, um, um, a very special guest here to do the keynote um, lecture. Um, let me um, introduce Douglas Cumming uh, to you. Douglas is um, a professor of finance and entrepreneurship and the Ontario Research Chair uh, in Economics and Public Policy at um, the Schoolage uh, School of Business, um, York University. He is uh, one of the world's leading experts uh, in the field of corporate finance. He's won numerous academic awards and he has consulted uh, for a number of private um, and, and governmental organizations in North America, in, in Europe and in Australia. And we're very happy to have you here as a keynote speaker. Um, but before um, we turn to the peak uh, of, of this uh, evening, let's, uh, let me just um, briefly thank a couple of persons or institutions. So first of all, uh, thank you very much to our sponsor, uh, NER, uh, Rechtsanwälte, for providing generous support to make this event happen. Um, thank you uh, to the Bibliotheksgesellschaft of Humboldt University Berlin and the um, uh, German Research Foundation for additional support. Um, thanks to Humboldt University for providing this awesome location. I'm really thrilled by, 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 this, by these rooms. Um, thanks to all participants, all presenters, discussants, and the chairmen and women um, at the scientific part of the conference. And last but not least, um, thanks to um, my assistants, um, Tobias Schilling and Antonia Felber, uh, for basically doing all the work which was involved in organizing this conference. Thank you very much. So without further ado, Douglas, please. Super. Thanks very much for the opportunity to be here and uh, talk about fintech and the risk of financial regulation. I know I was supposed to talk about 
sort of financial regulation in general in fintech. And so I mulled it over for quite a while and wondered what sort of angle I would take. And part of where I rested on focusing on the risk of regulation stemmed from a number of experiences that I've had over the past couple of years dealing with uh, regulators in Canada. I'm Canadian, so I like to say I apologize for being born Canadian. That just happened. I couldn't control it. I'm still sorry about that. We apologize about everything in Canada. Um, and uh, so I had thought I'd give a bunch of uh, anecdotes about uh, financial regulation in Canada and how that really does involve a lot of risks and a lot of uncertainty. And now that I see there's some cameras on, I'm a little more nervous about doing that. So we'll see how, uh, see how we progress. So what, what will, uh, just a bit of a roadmap. We'll begin a little bit with our, uh, an overview of FinTech and regulation of FinTech. And I'm gonna show how that can involve a number of extreme risks some of the consequences of those risks, and at the risk of doing uh, something a little more academic, I can apply this to a project that I had worked on with Armin Schwienbacher and show how those risks are non-trivial. But I know it's late in the day on Friday, so I promise not to show you any tables or regressions, just maybe a few uh, cute pictures and the like. Good, so uh, FinTech, what is it about? Well. Uh, people love talking about these five Ds of FinTech. So it's nice to always keep this in mind what the objective is, including democratization, so the democratization of capital, which is terrific in the day and age of, for example, lawsuits against Kleiner Perkins for gender bias and venture capital, uh, ethnic bias, other, uh, you know, problems that come in the allocation of capital, having a, a capital democratized, everybody loves it. Disaggregation, so we um, end up with services that are faster, better, uh, cheaper, not uh, centralized through inefficient vehicles. Uh, getting rid of the middleman entirely, disintermediation. I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, decentralization, so there's some nice advantages associated with self-regulation, uh, uh, better technology, and consensus to catch wrongdoers. And lastly, debiasing. So if you get rid of you know, conflicts of interest in the financial system, you end up with an overall better financial system. And these five Ds really sort of point to a general thing that makes us all super excited about FinTech, which is the fact that it can disrupt people that deserve to be disrupted. And no better example of this than mutual funds. So I'm gonna begin with a fun example of mutual funds. And it's so fun to hate mutual funds because there's so many great examples going back to books written by John Bogle, uh, uh, the founder of Vanguard. He has these colorful char char uh, characterizations and colorful titles on some of his books about uh, the battle for the soul of capitalism, where you have whole industries where their fees exceed their returns. So in other words, another way to say this is that they're you know, negative value added in the sense that they charge more for their services than the returns that they give, and that's on average, on average. Of course, there's some outliers that do better, but it's, it's really fun to think about this, and. I'm going to um, tell you uh, this fun thing that's going on in Canada over the last uh, uh, number of years, which is what uh, you have been smart to get rid of in continental Europe, dating back to about a decade ago, is you got rid of these things called trailer fees, which essentially pay an advisor an annual commission for keeping a client's money into a fund. And those trailer, trailing commissions, you know, in the uh, range is typically in a uh, quarter of a percentage point up to one and a half percentage points. Uh, so say hypothetically, if you had $100,000 in mutual funds, every year, a thousand of that, if say if it's a 1% fee, a thousand would go to pay your advisor just for the 
service of keeping you within that fund. And in, in Canada, those fees uh, collectively are quite large. So the magnitude is in the order of uh, six billion per year. And when we did a study, so this is uh, a little bit of self-promotion, I guess you'd say. We did a study of this uh, over the last couple of years. And this showed up in the paper last week because I'm facing a lot of people in Canada in the mutual fund industry that have told me that I should move, uh, that, uh, that I, on my you know, gravestone it's going to say responsible for the death of the Canadian mutual fund industry, and other sort of character, colorful things that people are extremely allocate, uh, uh, upset with me about for doing this project showing that these uh, fees really give rise to misallocation of capital. And uh, there, of course, there are policy consequences to this, but that's, you know, whether those policy consequences, you know, happen and the regulators do the right thing is a matter of, of uh, significant debate because we really don't know where that's going to going to end up and whether they'll do what they did in continental Europe and in the UK and Australia and ban these fees or not. But if they did, we certainly think it would be a useful, useful thing. And so where does that take us? Well, it takes us to what I want to think about in these nice pictures of financial intermediation and how that could relate to regulation and our five Ds that we like with FinTech. So, the first is this potential for disintermediation. So what that means is that you have this intermediary in the middle, whether it's a bank, a mutual fund, private equity, venture capital, some other intermediary. Um, if we disintermediate, we're essentially removing the middleman. Uh, democratizing capital, we end up you know, uh, having a broader uh, set of investors a broader set of entrepreneurs that can access the financial system. If there's some sort of decentralization, then the uh, spotlight, if you will, is, is uh, much broader, uh, not through uh, centralized intermediaries. And disaggregation, FinTech has this potential to have less friction, faster services, lower cost, and uh, significantly, uh, no bias in reporting, which is often one of the main agency problems associated with intermediaries. Now, where does regulation typically happen in this traditional system? So in the traditional system, we have regulation, financial regulation, largely, not exclusively, but largely focused on controlling what the intermediary does. So if you take, for example, the uh, banks, then regulation, a significant part of it anyway, is done through the Basel rules, such as capital adequacy uh, ratios and the like. If you were to look at hedge funds, uh, they face different regulations around the world, including minimum capitalization, restrictions on what type of service providers they're allowed to use, where those service providers are located, um, and who they can actually sell their products to through different distribution channels. Uh, mutual funds themselves have all sorts of uh, regulations that, again, are focused on the intermediary. With fintech and disintermediation, things have changed a lot, which is interesting because it's going to really change the regulatory landscape because there's less of a need to focus on the intermediary, particularly if the intermediary is in some way disrupted or possibly doesn't exist anymore, depending on the particular type of fintech innovation that exists. And so what some regulators have done in some contexts has shifted our regulatory focus from uh, the intermediaries to focusing on investors uh, that might invest uh, and users of that capital, which could include individuals, entrepreneurs, public firms, or any other people that might have a need for capital. And so the FinTech regulation is rather a rather different animal relative to what we've seen with 
regular financial intermediation. And examples of this, and I'll shift in a minute to crowdfunding. Some of you, or many of you today, have uh, presented papers on crowdfunding. And some of these examples include, for example, limits on inv investment amounts on investors, uh, how many times they can invest each year, other such things. Uh, on the individual side and entrepreneurs, uh, some great examples include how many times you can raise capital or how much capital you are allowed to raise. And that's, of course, quite an interesting, uh, different approach because in the traditional sense, if I can back up and remind you with banks, hedge funds, mutual funds, and the like, we don't have regulators telling us uh, you're only allowed to put a certain amount of money in, in the mutual funds, for instance, and, and support the lavish lifestyle and trailer fees with mutual funds and not with uh, uh, other forms. And then likewise, banks are not going to tell you, oh, you can only put a certain amount of money into a bank. Uh, so that's really a, a sort of almost pejorative or uh, uh, hand-holding approach to financial regulation as a way to, uh, if you will, curtail possible risks associated with the system and uh, possible concerns that might give rise to career concerns that regulators face. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Before we do that, just a quick look at crowdfunding platforms, because indeed so many papers on the program on crowdfunding, and it's extremely popular today, these days. And in this case, we haven't done away with the financial intermediary. We've just introduced a new type. And with that new type, we have a mixed form of regulation that includes typically limits on investment amounts. On the platforms, there can be stringent due diligence requirements for, for what is posed in regards to allowing uh, entrepreneurs to participate. And then likewise with entrepreneurs, we still put limits on the amount of capital that they're able to raise each year. So that's our new world of financial regulation with FinTech. And what I would like to do in, at this stage then is uh, say some things that make me a bit nervous to have the cameras rolling. So got to got to uh, bite my tongue a little bit, but uh, we'll see what comes out. So the, the three things I want to talk about are firstly, who writes the rules and how that rule writing process ha has happened. And as I said, I'll give some anecdotes from a Canadian perspective. And then uh, secondly, I'll talk about, you know, political, the, the political interference with respect to financial uh, regulation. Then secondly, I'll tell, give you some anecdotes about lobbyists' uh, involvement in rule writing. And then lastly, uh, talk about some uh, consequences associated with bans. And each of these things are pertinent to fintech and apply to some other contexts as well, but naturally fintech are focus. So to begin, the first of these three, part, part one or part A of the first of these three, uh, is to think about employees as securities regulators and how this could be uh, the, how, how we should think about the risks of financial regulation. So the typical uh, employee at a securities regulator has strong incentives to be safe, strong incentives to be safe. And so over the past uh, year, for instance, I've been on a board, the Small and Medium Sized Enterprise Board at the Ontario Securities Commission. Believe it or not, in Canada, if you're not aware, we have different securities commissions in every province, including, for instance, Prince Edward Island, where there's about 100,000 people living there, for example. So it's a little bit of a crazy thing. Canadians are crazy. As I said, I'm sorry I'm Canadian, uh, especially in the context of securities regulation. So on this board at the Ontario Securities Commission, I had discovered that they were extremely hardworking and diligent in respect of introducing crowdfunding rules. 
and they recognize that that is an essential uh, thing to have. We need to have crowdfunding because every other country is, seems to be doing it, so we must also have it in Canada, and there's tremendous demand for it. But what, what uh, a set of extremely risk-averse incentives does is that it, 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 it can uh, lead to, in some cases, regulatory overkill. And so just to give a sort of insight as to how, that, how this can work out for you is that, uh, and how this process happened over this uh, review. So the, the review that was done was so extensive, looking at every possible risk that could take place in respect of, of uh, crowdfunding, uh, all the different angles of every possible thing that could go wrong, and writing a set of rules to cut off all possible uh, uh, conflicts of interest or wrongdoing that can happen. And what, what you end up having is, is um, such a, you, it's a, if you will, like building this, this room with Fort Knox around it and so where, the, where the walls are so strong that actually nobody can enter. Uh, so you have a, a, new, a new securities exemption without anybody taking up that exemption. So that's one possible outcome with those types of incentives. A second um, example is uh, what I've discovered in the context of this mutual fund regulation that I've been involved with, uh, or I should say contributing to on the empirical side over the last few years, is uh, you discover that everybody at the regulator isn't necessarily uh, interested in um, that is their end game. And so there's this great uh, story, for instance, a few years ago that came out of Rolling Stone magazine, believe it or not, where they talked about uh, financial regulators frequently being hired by Wall Street firms uh, as, as a huge payoff and huge incentive to go work for a financial regulator. And uh, what I had, what I'm now relieved that I retracted the uh, anecdote that I had up on the slide, and maybe just sort of cut to the chase, is that in uh, mutual fund regulation, we've especially when there's $6 billion at stake, what you end up seeing is, is uh, sometimes people get hired away. So when this project started, for instance, uh, one of the head legal, legal counsels at the commission was hired by one of the biggest mutual funds that's uh, the greatest defender vis-a-vis -vis these, these uh, trailer fees. And, and uh, likewise, other people at the commission seem to have differential preferences towards being accommodating towards industry. So that's a second risk about how you might end up with some random outcomes vis-a-vis -vis financial regulation. Um, the third, or uh, this is uh, part two of my uh, out outline here about who writes rules. The third one that can come into play with, with regards to financial regulation is political involvement in writing rules that influence intermediaries. Uh, and here I'm gonna just show you some fun examples. Um, so you may be aware we have a very cool politician as our prime minister in Canada. And our cool politician is really good at, at politics and not so great at economics. Uh, his, um, uh, I'm not sure you're familiar, that familiar with Trudeau, but uh, he, his, his background was in, uh, a, he was a elementary school teacher that taught drama that became Canada's prime minister. And so the, uh, one, one of his election promises to, a group that funded his, his campaign uh, was to bring back something known as the labor-sponsored venture capital tax credit, which was brought back at the federal level. And that was banned by the prior government. There's good reason why it was banned. And this is a graph I put up a few times in the past and shown some folks, so this will be a reminder for you. But what this picture is just telling you from the early 90s up until roughly 2005, that it was extremely unfortunate to have these tax subsidies to subsidize this financial intermediary called a labor-sponsored venture capital fund, a really, really inefficient tax subsidy. And you see the returns to US venture capital, to small cap stocks, 
large cap stocks, and 30-day T-bills, so the worst possible return you could ever hope to, to beat, and our tax-subsidized vehicle uh, barely you know, beat the 30-day T-bill index in the peak of the internet bubble, and then basically went back down to zero. So it's the equivalent of designing financial regulation where you, you know, have someone dig a hole, and then with the same dirt that you just took out, you put it back into the, into the hole, because you're not, not creating any economic value. And so the uh, federal government recognized this, uh, you know, roughly about five years ago. And then with a new politician that comes in play, they reintroduce this rule because uh, there are s some very wealthy people that have been uh, uh, helped out by this, this uh, type of regulation and gets put back into place. And so back in um, uh, this, these latter years after showing folks this, I was told many, many times that I, I'm one of these dumb academics that's backward looking at data. You need to think of the future and how things are going to go. So just for fun, I decided to, you know, I was told by tons of people, stop looking back. You're missing the good opportunities that we can create. So if you're wondering how things worked out since then, instead of, you know, here's the labor-sponsored funds that tax-subsidized financial vehicle, you, uh, instead of just keeping your money, you would have lost about half of it since the, since the meantime. So, so politicians involved in financial regulation is a significant risk. So it's not just the people at the Securities Commission writing regulation, also their political involvement. I'll show you another good example of political involvement in, um, in regulation and, and, and business subsidies. This is another one from uh, uh, Ontario. And it's unique data, as far as I'm aware, no other similar data exists elsewhere. But why this one is so fun is it just gives a, a, a nice graphic as to what politicians cater to. And here we see uh, significant catering, in other words, government programs that where you get substantially more money and you're way more likely to get money if you're substantially larger. So instead of subsidizing entrepreneurial markets, they cater to large organizations as well as older organizations. So the larger you are, the older you are, the more likely you're get, gonna get uh, uh, benefits and handouts through government-created programs. Okay, so the, the, the next um, part I wanna tell you about risk and financial regulation. By the way, how are we doing for time? I'd, Excellent. So the ne next part I want to tell you about is uh, lobby, group, lobby groups and advocacy groups. And the, in, in many places, what we see uh, taking a non-trivial role in, in uh, debating what the right financial regulation is or should be involves think tanks. And the, the trouble that, we, that we've seen, for example, in the case of this mutual fund regulation, is that when think, think tanks get involved, they typically receive their funding from uh, institutions that benefit by keeping bad rules uh, still in place. And uh, do things like putting pressure on those that are at the Securities Commission, among other things, uh, to uh, promote regulation that uh, is less efficient, which w would otherwise be. Now, my third final point on this uh, issue is in respect of uh, fintech and how regulation can sometimes result, result in some extreme outcomes. And this is a fun picture from The Economist this week, if you didn't see it, uh, where they have this nice graphic where we show what happened in China, where China used to uh, be the most significant player in respect of, of uh, Bitcoin in, in terms of worldwide trading volume. And then for some uh, ambiguous reasons that are speculated on in The Economist, uh, possibly to do with who works at financial regulators. Uh, 
uh, and politicians, some things that we've just talked about, they decided to ban it. And when you see the implications of that are quite clear on this uh, graph showing where trading volume is not happening anymore and typical Bitcoin prices over these uh, periods. So regulatory changes, in other words, can have drastic implications for the development of new financial products. And the regulation themselves is a non-trivial concern that even in some uh, uh, otherwise well-to-do countries can lead to some, some rather uh, random outcomes. Okay, so that, that's a long way of getting to my uh, main message is that financial regulation is indeed a risk and the regulations that we end up with aren't always the optimal ones which can have significant implications for uh, fintech. So I'm gonna show you an application of this idea in work that I did with Armin Schwienbacher who is in the audience and we decided that we look at fintech venture capital. And uh, why fintech venture capital? Well, VCs are really good at figuring out what the new disruptive technology is gonna be. And in the last few years, they have uh, really gotten into this game in a significant way, uh, not just in Germany, but also around the world. And we were inspired by a number of quotes. So here's a few that I took from Business Insider. We got from uh, Computer Business Review, VentureBeat, and Bloomberg, other sources. Are they saying that, uh, you know, this is, this is incredibly important, you should look at this, and that's what we decided to do. And largely, uh, this FinTech, of course, as I'm sure you're aware, began with the financial crisis, which uh, showed this incredible, incredible boom in many places around the world. Now, one, one thing we also noticed is, is uh, this is from Forbes uh, about a year ago. Uh, what Forbes talked about is that regulation in FinTech is, is of course, extremely important, uh, something that needs to be focused on. And for early stage startups, if you're faced with regulatory burdens, then that could be a tremendous source of problems for you. And so one thing that Forbes says here is that uh, uh, small companies and big companies often face the same set of regulations, but there's tremendous differences in the enforcement of those regulations depending on your size and depending on where you're located. So in particular, places that have uh, a relative dearth of regulation, a comparative dearth, and those in particular in countries that have less enforcement, um, especially in places without a financial center, uh, startups for FinTech have some advantages, some advantages. And we wanted to see whether or not that's actually true in the data that we examined. So we went out and got a worldwide uh, data set from the Thompson SEC data set. And we wanted to see whether, in fact, regulation is, is systematically, you know, the risk of regulation systematically drives international differences in fintech deals. And, uh, you know, our best guess, based on what we saw in Forbes, is that indeed fintech is going to be relatively more popular in places without a financial center that would have a, a less severe enforcement of, of regulation. Likewise, um, in the VC world, there is enormous heterogeneity in good VCs and bad VCs. And good VCs that have memory, such as the uh, uh, VCs that uh, experienced the dot-com bubble, uh, perhaps less inclined to uh, uh, get hyped up by the bubble, which in turn would lead to some differences in, in success of these types of deals. And I said I wouldn't show you any equations or numbers, but this is just one real simple equation I'm just gonna show you without scaring anybody off, I hope, or annoying people at the end of a long day, is you can, of course, run differences, difference in differences regressions uh, to see wh whether or not the impact of uh, 
of uh, regulation in countries without major financial centers after the financial crisis gave rise to a differential impact on fintech. And in terms of the data and the statistical significance, it's of course there. The economic significance is actually quite large. And this is a really simple estimate. You see about a 100% difference in, in uh, the deal changes after the uh, financial crisis. If you want to look at some of these things graphically, so what we put up here in dark are, are the ones with fintech in non-financial centers, and then the red dotted ones are fintech in, or sorry, the non-fintech in non-financial centers. And looking at the, the here, these are differences, so the fintech in the non-financial centers versus the fintech in financial centers, and do the same differencing for the non-fintech for the non-financial centers versus the financial centers. And if we normalize 2007, the start of the financial crisis is, as our point of uh, comparison, you see that over the subsequent years, a significant rise in FinTech deals in non-financial centers relative to financial centers compared to their non-FinTech counterparts. Um, you could do this for uh, different types of venture capitalists. So the limited partnerships versus the corporate versus the financial institutions. We took a look at this for differences among uh, VCs depending on their size uh, and their investment rounds. And essentially where we see the big differences arising are with the limited partnership ones and the smaller ones, so the smaller, less uh, sophisticated ones. And graphically shows up uh, in a very pronounced way where financial regulation seems to be an, an enormous driver of where startups happen. Again, this is number of investment rounds, uh, this, uh, uh, the VC rounds, and then the total volume of these rounds. No matter which way you cut the data, you see this come out in the sample. and then. How do these deals work out? Uh, well, they tend to uh, not do so well, particularly when it's been done by a less uh, sophisticated investor in, uh, in the absence of regulatory oversight. So far, on average, those deals haven't done as well. Okay, so my just a quick wrap up. Uh, what I've tried to convey today uh, is that with a few uh, Canadian anecdotes and one or two from China as well, uh, that fintech regulation is a risk, a uh, non-trivial risk that I think as academics we sort of take uh, regulation for granted without thinking of where that regulation came from and uh, whether or not it's the most efficient uh, or proper thing to have in the system. And in the case of fintech, it can either create a market or completely destroy a market. And I gave you a few anecdotes to show you how that uh, has come to be. Take Bitcoin in China, take crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding in Canada, where you can literally have markets either facilitated or totally impeded. And how those regulations come to be is uh, uh, rather, uh, not, uh, I dare say random, but definitely involves tremendous amount of risk. And do people pay attention to these risks? Well, certainly in this uh, small application that we saw to the venture capital market, it does appear to be something that people are focusing on to a great deal. So thanks once again. Hope I didn't go over time. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.